face God. Well, I'm going to do something I haven't done in a while. I'm going to start a new series. I haven't preached a series in a while. Uh, and I, was it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? When was it? I don't remember when it was, but uh, I woke up. I woke up at 5.30, and listen, 5.30 doesn't mean that I'm spiritual, all right? It just means that I woke up, okay? So don't, don't think, oh, pastor, he's so spiritual, he gets up at 5.30. No, seven. Uh, seven's when I really wake up. But I got up, I woke up at 5.30 and stirred for a minute because it, I started to hear this particular psalm in my heart. Okay, it was Tuesday. Good. Yeah. Started be to begin to hear this psalm that was in my heart. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. And so I went back to sleep. And I laid there half in, half out. But the whole time, all I could hear was myself. And maybe it wasn't myself. Maybe it was the Spirit of God. It sounded like me, but I just kept saying this psalm over and over and over and over and over. And I was like, okay, God, you're trying to make a point here. So uh, when I wake up at seven uh, and, and get, get some things in order, uh, the, next, the next thing to do is cup of coffee, sit down and see what you're saying. And so from that birthed this series. And hopefully you see the graphic up there. Call it the simple life. The simple life. And I, I want to get back to something, to, to something kind of simple here. Because, uh, listen, in a complicated world, the one thing we really need right now is uh, simplicity. Can, can anybody agree with me on that? And, and, and I think that one of the things we need more than anything else right now is the simplicity of the gospel. Uh, I, I want you to understand something. The gospel matters more than anything else in all the world. The gospel is the only thing that can truly change a life. The gospel is the only thing that can truly change perspective. The gospel is really the only thing that has ever changed history. History is filled with, rep with repetition, destruction, war, violence, all of those things. What has really truly changed the world has always been the gospel. That's why it is the most hotly contested and hotly debated topic you will ever ever here because it in our natural mind uh, in reality our in our natural way of thinking it is just absolutely impossible that one man could do anything like this we can't fathom that one man would do this for the world Paul even says it like this. They said, uh, uh, he says, no, no one would die for a righteous man. We might die for a good man. You, you, you might give your life for that. And we've had so many. We have Memorial Day and we, and, and we honor those who have gone before us and fought wars and shed blood for freedom. And, and, and we remember all of those things. And, and, it's, and it's a great feeling to know that somebody paid the price so that you and I can gripe and complain every day. But when it comes to fixing wrongdoing, when it comes to fixing that nature within us that can truly take someone... Listen, I, I, I told this, this testimony, what, a few months back about a, a gentleman that went back to, our, to the church we were youth pastors at in Houston and remembered 
the impact of the, of the youth ministry and the word that we, that we would share and the power of God that was in that place. There was more than those testimonies. We, we were able to hear testimonies from teachers who, who were hearing from other teachers, teachers that went to our, our church and we were hearing from them about how these kids were nothing but trouble. We're talking lifers in ISS and, and, and constantly they would get in the face of the teacher. They would be violent. It was, it was all of this stuff was going on and, and, and they were just like, these are the, these are the kids that you just, you just know in your mind and, and, and in reality you just think to yourself, these are the kids that are going to fill the prisons in the future. And, and we would see it and we would hear time and time again, they would, they would say, there was this teacher, they were sitting in the, uh, in the room, uh, the teacher's lounge, that's what it's called, the teacher's lounge. And they were talking about how just overnight this kid has changed. And they would say, well, which kid are you talking about? It's, it's this boy. And he said he's been going to this place on Wednesday nights and he's been a part of this program and, and, and all he can know is, is that Jesus sat down and convinced him that what he, do, what he was doing wasn't good and he needed to change. It, it wasn't me communicating it, it wasn't Stacy communicating it, it was that he would had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And, and, and so that's why I say that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the one theme in all of the world that can absolutely turn the world upside down and bring change. And in a world that is so consistently complicated, we need the simplicity of the gospel. <laughs> Well, I totally jumped right out of my notes, but that's all right. We're going to have fun with it. Because I'm not going to tell that stupid joke. All right, we joke. <laughs> I fear that as Christians we have in many ways forgotten sometimes the simplicity of the gospel. Because we get caught up in the complex. Living by the statement that nothing is ever as it seems has geared us into living out a reality that is counterproductive to pure faith. Because nothing is ever as it seems, we further complicate with our imagination. We further complicate things. And, and so because of that, we have set aside pure faith. You know, uh, or you all know me that I have a desire to dig deeply into the depths of the word and to pull out the Greek and the Hebrew and grammar and culture and context and the list really goes on and on. That just drives me on a daily basis. It's what I love to do. And I believe that there is a place for this and that there is a purpose. In fact, me personally having greater understanding has simplified the power of the gospel down to its base tenets and created a, a greater joy in my life because of it. Listen, I'm a happier guy because I have dug deep and found the simplicity in the gospel. I'm not a happier guy. No one, no one's amening that like they think I'm a happier guy. Okay. I, all right. Great. Thanks. Um, it's not so I go around telling everything that I know, and even though I probably do that at times, but but because I know it, it's it's not that I want to tell everybody what I know. It's because for me, life has slowed down. Now, I want you to understand that it's not because I don't have kids in the home anymore that life has slowed down. It's not because I get the opportunity every night to hang out, watch TV with my wife, kick up my feet, and just exist. I'm not talking about life slowing down like that. I want to liken it to what I've been experiencing lately. You see, um, I went from becoming being a substitute teacher to becoming... A referee. And I love being a referee. Love it. Because it gives me that sports connection that I that I that I just, you know, I thrive off of. So I'm 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 refereeing basketball right now. I'm currently in volleyball. And, and the one thing that I have learned in being and becoming a referee, and, and yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not perfect. At it. 
But one thing that I have learned is that the more that I dig into the rules of the game, and the more that I understand what you can and cannot do, and the more I understand the boundaries within which you work and the freedom that you have within those boundaries, the more that I understand that, the more the game slows down for me. And, and you know, that's the, that's the thing that you hear on, on commentators and stuff. They're always talking about these guys are like, man, they, they've said that the game has just slowed down for them. It's not that the game really slowed down, ladies and gentlemen, because how many of you know that if you've ever gone to watch volleyball or basketball, very active, constantly moving, you, the pauses you have are just the moments to pick up the ball, get ready to serve, and then serve the ball. But after that, all, all bets are off. The action's everywhere. And so if you're not careful, you will ball watch, and you will watch where everything's going, and you will act like a ping pong ball everywhere. Okay, and, and so, but what has happened is, is in the midst of all of the action, of all of the chaos, of, of, of in basketball, running up and down the court and seeing the passes and seeing it all happen and seeing the guys knocking into each other and, and the back and forth and the running out of breath. In all of that, what has happened is that in knowing the guidelines, the framework, my role in that framework, it doesn't matter how chaotic it gets. It always slows down to where I'm seeing everything. To where I see stuff that I wouldn't normally see. To where I can stand here and see over there. And it just, it slows the game down. And people go, well, there's no way that you saw that. No. I did see it because I understand the rules. I understand the framework. And so I want you to understand why did I call this the simple life? Because if you understand the framework, if you understand the rules, it doesn't matter how fast paced the world begins to become. It doesn't matter how fast the world gets. It doesn't matter how chaotic the world gets. Life will slow down. And what will amaze people around you is that not that you are walking slower because you can walk at the pace of the world, but there's a pace of peace that slows everything down. Does that make sense? And, and so I, wanted, I, I, want, I call this the simple life, and, and I'll get to this picture here in just a second. You'll, you'll hear what's, what's going on there in just a minute. But that's what this series is about. I want the game of life to slow down for you. I, I want the pace of peace to become your focus. I know some of you may be thinking that this will be a study of the Ten Commandments, but that isn't the case. Those are paramount to living the Christian life today. And Paul tells us that they are upheld by us through faith in Jesus' blood, covering our sins and washing us clean of the filth of a sinful life. And I want your belief and faith to increase exponentially to live victoriously in this life and to elevate your level of worship. Anybody want victory? Okay, I'm just making sure everybody wants some victory in their lives. I want to elevate you to the next place. God's calling us to a new level. He's always calling us to a new level. And you've heard us say it time and time and time again. And, and can I tell you that it is not a new level that is be because we have reached that level that God had called us to before. Because I'll be honest and tell you, the new level we're going to is the same level that he's called us to. But the reason it feels so new is because we keep going around the mountain. And so I, I, I say this lovingly, God's calling us to a new place. He's co calling us to a new level. It's just time that we stop choosing to go around the mountain. Does that make sense? And so I, I, I share this with you to elevate you to the next place, to elevate you to the next concept and, and, and sense of faith and, and, and depth of relationship with the Lord. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 23. 
Psalm 23. We're actually going to do a series on the 23rd Psalm. Everybody knows it. So I'm not, uh, I'm not worried about whether you have not heard this one or not. Most of the time, uh, while, while there are people who do uh, the Lord's Prayer during a sporting event, a lot of, a lot of guys, I knew some, uh, one basketball team I was on for whatever reason, I don't know why, we would quote the 23rd Psalm. It never worked. <laughs> we lost. But whatever, okay, I was like, maybe that's not a sporting prayer that we should be praying. But we're going to look at the 23rd Psalm over the next several weeks and we're going to break it down. And dive into the rules established by this psalm. And Together, I believe that the game of life will begin to slow down. So let's read it together. A psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely... Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Good song. Good song. And today we're going to actually, we're going to focus on verse 1. Just verse 1. So you can keep your thumb there for, for verse 1. But understand this. David does not write this psalm as the king. In the pinnacle of his anointed rule over Israel. He writes this in the field with his sheep. He takes into consideration not just his role as a shepherd caring for the flock. But he considers more importantly his response as a sheep to the shepherd. In other words I want you to understand this. David's not writing this as a shepherd. David's writing this as a sheep. He's not writing this from someone in charge. He's writing this from someone who has been placed under someone else's charge. Right, right. And so when we read this, it's, I, I think it's high time we understand that, that it's important to read this in light of, yes... How he was writing it, what he was seeing, where he was at. Several theologians also take into consideration where this may have been written. It is interesting to note that the landscape isn't just lush everywhere. In fact, a lot of Israel is, it does have some grass, but it's hard. It's rocks, it's dirt. It is definitely a, a, a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. And there are those places in, in, uh, in the land that are lush and are wonderful. But David is not riding from one of these lush places. He's literally riding from a wilderness. Okay? So he's riding this not from the place of comfort you might consider. He's riding it from a location that is not ideal. Okay, it's believed that when David wrote this, this particular psalm that he was actually with his flock caring for them in the middle of wilderness area in the southern portion of Israel. Wilderness is dry. It is arid. It isn't a desert and it isn't an oasis either. The, the Jordan River does run through into the Dead Sea and there are small streams that are available but it can still make for a difficult environment. So I realize David isn't writing from a position of extravagance. He is in real time writing about his current circumstances and making declarations about his God in the middle of those circumstances. And so I want to spend my time focusing on verse 1 today. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Because I want you to understand this, the simple life begins... And ends in lordship. The simple life begins and ends in lordship. But we're going to work backwards on this verse. Some of you thought I was going to start off at the beginning. No, I'm going to start off at the end. Because the beginning is the climax. But here we are. The, first, the, 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 
place we're going to start is he says, I shall not want, or, or in other words, I lack nothing. The revelation of lordship is realized in the peace that comes from lacking nothing. I, I know most of you probably experience this at some level. You enjoy when everything's taken care of. You like it when the cabinets are full. You like it when the fridge has what it needs. You like it when the water is running. You, you like it when the, well, when the grass has been mowed at the very least. You like it when there's gas in the car. You like it when every detail of your life has completely been taken care of. But we go into panic when we start missing things. Okay, that might just be me. All right, I'm, I, I, I thought I was connecting with somebody out there. You see, this seems like a common theme here lately, that peace is vital to our psyche. Jesus said that in him we have peace, that he has given us his peace because of the trials we might face. We can even account for peace when Jesus speaks to the storm in the beginning of his trek in, in, in discipling those 12 disciples. It was very early on in his relationship with the 12 that a storm catches them while they're all out on the Sea of Galilee and Jesus is asleep in the storm. Now, I, I'm not going to preach on that and yet I want you to understand the fact that Jesus was asleep meant he expected the storm. He wasn't surprised by it at all and he didn't care. Oh, pastor, Jesus cares. Yes, he cares, but he wasn't concerned. You, you understand what I'm talking about? So when they get to him and they say, Jesus, Jesus, wake up, wake up, wake up. We're going to die. Do something. Why is it that 12 men in a boat couldn't control themselves in the storm and they thought the 13th man would be able to? That's something to ponder. Jesus wakes up, rubs his eyes and goes, peace, be still. And everything shut down. And they marveled, how in the world can the wind and the waves obey this man's voice? He spoke peace in the midst of chaos. He spoke peace in the midst of their chaos. And so for Jesus to say, in me you will have peace, in this world you will have trial, but face it, I gave you my peace so that in me you would have peace. Ladies and gentlemen, peace is a good thing. And we always experience peace when our ducks are in a row. And David's first truth connected to lordship is that all needs are taken care of in the Lord. The literal Hebrew translation reads this way, to lack, or by implication, to fail. Who knew that? To want, or to lessen, to be abated, to bereave, to decrease, to cause to fail, to, to make lower. In, in other words, he covers all of the things. It's not just your personal possessions. It's not just your food in your cabinet. It's not just all your bills being paid. It's when life has taken a bite out of you. And you feel less. It's when there is something that has gotten into your head that has caused depression. It's when something has, has, has taken you over and you are now anxious. In any way, shape, or form. If it can be compared to loss, Jesus has taken care of it. This is, this is the revelation David is having. It doesn't matter whether, even in my loss, I am not losing anything. Even, even when it seems like life has taken the chunk out of me, I'm taken care of. In, in, in other words, it's almost like in Christ, slough off the stuff that doesn't matter. Because you are already in his hands taken care of. It describes this idea of suffering any kind of loss in any kind of context. And yet David is filled with the confidence boldly to declare that even in an apparent loss, he does not diminish at all. This is not just a statement, it's a declared belief. He doesn't say, I hope. He, he doesn't say uh, uh, any of those things, uh, 
anything that re, would regard uh, uh, desperation. David has no desperation in his statement, I shall not want. He's not, he, he, he has all the confidence in all of the world that everything will be taken care of. So he's, he is not at all, yes, he's concerned, he just doesn't, or, or excuse me, he cares, he's just not concerned. Mm. I, I, I want you to hear that because it's important for us. To get to the place where it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. It doesn't matter what feels like it's taking a chunk out of you. It doesn't matter what type of loss you may be feeling. It doesn't matter any of those things. Yes, I care. But in Christ, I'm not concerned. And just hear the heart behind that. Don't go out from here and go, Pastor cares about us, but he's not concerned. Uh, th don't think that. I care. Uh, there is that level of concern. But in Jesus Christ, a bold declaration says, I shall not want. There is nothing that can be taken away from me that is going to cause a lack in me. Mm. This doesn't mean that the feeling or the situation does not arise in our lives from this point forward. But it does mean that I will have a foundational place from which I will carry myself in this life regardless of the, of the situation. Now, I'm not talking about prosperity preaching either. This is not confessing your way into prosperity without a solid, proactive engagement in your situation. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not like Doris Day singing Que Sera, Sera and carelessly expecting God to bring a blessing to your life. Listen, there is a stewardship of what you have been given, and that does, in fact, matter a lot. Can, can, just on a side note, you don't get to confess financial blessing when you're not a financial steward. You don't get to confess your way out of things when you are not obedient in the thing that you are trying to confess over. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm. So if you are not taking, listen, if you are not taking care of your mind in some way, doing some things that need to be taken care of, if you're not taking care of your finances, if you're not taking care of your family, if you're not doing any of those things, you can't confess the blessing of God over that. There has to be a position of stewardship within there. However, and, and notice here, th this, is, this is the point of it. Yes, David is confessing this, that I shall not want. But he's actively participating in making sure. He's not doing things for God. He's not trying to tell God how to do things. He's just walking actively. He's living and he's being a good steward of what he's been given. So can I challenge you, it doesn't matter what you've got, if you're not a good steward of it, don't expect God to bless it. Right. Well, thank you. That's a hard word because nobody likes that. You can't have a bigger building if you're not willing to be a steward of the building you got. You can't have a bigger house if you're not willing to be a steward of the house. You can't have a better car if you're not willing to be a steward of your cars. You can't have, listen, you can have the brightest kid on the planet, but if you're not willing to work with them. My kid's smarter than all your kids. So what if he doesn't like to do homework? Not that smart then. Just saying. got to have this as a part of our lives. I shall not want. Now, I, I pass over that not, not lightly. But yet, that's not the main thought behind this. That is an, an addendum. Hey, I shall not want. I declare this over my life. But we got to move, move on from here because the second thing I want to talk about is he says, he, he says, my shepherd. So, I shall not want. Now, he says, my shepherd. 
The assurance of provision finds itself in the trustworthiness of the provider. Let me say that again. The assurance of provision finds itself in the trustworthiness of the provider. In fact, the term shepherd translates to mean one who cares for and protects or guards. David had no problem assigning this role because he understood the position. You see, leading sheep in a dry, arid region where not all animals were domesticated and apparently lions and bears run wild. Put that in perspective. We freak out when a black bear is caught on camera. Here in the United States, they run wild. At this time, they ran wild, I should say. <laughs> David would be required to see what the sheep couldn't in order to protect them and be able to know where the sources of provision for feeding and watering the sheep were. You see, here, and, and I guess if I'm going to blow this up uh, from this point, so if I shall not want is a matter of, of, of faith and it's a matter of trust and it is a matter of stewardship and, and, and declaration that your needs are taken care of, then you, will, you can't just declare this without having trust. And the one you're declaring will provide. Yeah. Yeah. And what that means, ladies and gentlemen, is you've got to get out of your comfort zone assuming where the provision is going to come from. See, the problem is David's writing this. Yes, he writes this from the perspective of a sheep having the experience of a shepherd. And so he understands if bears and, and, and lions run wild in the wilderness, he needs to think ahead of the enemy. And if he's thinking ahead of the enemy, sometimes he's going to lead you in a place of provision that doesn't look like provision. But once you get there, he's able to take what little you see and make it an abundance. And it's not just so that he can provide for you in that moment. It's because he sees where the enemies are coming from. And, and so sometimes we think to ourselves, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm just going to sit at home and I'm going to pray over my marriage. Because I don't want to have to be open and honest in a group of people about where my marriage is at. So I'm not going to go to the marriage groups that we have at the church. When God has provided a way for you to get your marriages started to be fixed. Oh, I don't trust that provision. When you don't see where the enemy's coming from. But your shepherd does, not me. Oh, y'all, come on now. I know I'm preaching. And so <laughs> we've got to get to this place of understanding. If I'm going to trust God, then I've got to trust that where he leads me yeah. is in his plan. Yeah. Now, here's the caveat. You have to go where he tells you to go. Yeah. You, uh, you, you can't go, oh, but Jesus, oasis. And he goes, wilderness. You go, oasis. That looks great. But you know if it's an oasis out in the middle of the desert, do you know what else is there? Sometimes it's a mirage. But think about this. If there's wild animals that live out there, where are they going to go for water? Oasis. Just saying. Now, I love the graphic that was designed for this series primarily because I designed it myself. A singular sheep. With the sun shining on it. So often, and I, I, I really, I hope you hear my heart in all of this today. So often we get the notion that sheep are ignorant. That actually is not the case. I did not know this. There is actually some value to sheep. Besides cotton pillows and clothing. And, and wool. Excuse me, wool, not cotton. Wool. They look alike when they're out in the field. I'm just saying. No. <laughs> just laugh at me, okay? Just enjoy. Yes, that's good. And I think that sometimes, okay, stop. The joyfulness is over, all right? It's, it's done. All right, I think sometimes we get the notion because Scripture says Jesus looked on the Jews as sheep without a shepherd. 
And then they quote the passage that says, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. That we read, uh, that we read into it that, sh- that sheep are directionless. That, that sheep are ignorant. That, that they've got to have... And, and, and I want to share some things with you because in preparation it was kind of interesting because here I am going, God, sheep are dumb. And he goes, look up if sheep are dumb. No, no, God, because if you prove me wrong, then I have to recant what I have heard. And so in preparation, I began to read. Reading is fundamental, guys. You need to learn to love and appreciate reading. Real books. <laughs> okay. Uh, and stuff. That's, that's just the old guy in me. Sorry. So I read some, some information and, and some, some blogs, some articles about the intelligence of sheep. And here's a summarized list for you. Get this. First one. Sheep like most animals, are able to learn and recognize their own names. I did not know that. That's why I'm always like, sheep. (laughs) Sheep can remember and recognize familiar human faces and are even able to distinguish one sheep from another, able to remember as many as 50 different sheep now for up to two years. They can even recognize photographs of the familiar human faces and can tell the difference between human facial expressions. One particular study had, the, had these sheep, they were, they were basically with this person individually. They, were, they, they spent time, I don't know how long the study was, but it was significant enough that the sheep recognized him. If, if, if say, I'm the character, I'm standing with the sheep, he was able to be recognized by the sheep. When he walked in the room, they would come to him. And they, 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 they then removed the sheep, put them in another room, and, and in that room they put a photograph of that individual and the photograph of somebody that looked similar to that individual. And the sheep disregarded the similarity and stood in front of the one. Y'all know, y'all know. Sheep are, are capable of developing knowledge about various plants and other foods that are good for them versus the ones that may be toxic. Even able to self-medicate or, and have self-medicating behavior has been observed in sheep. Who knew? I didn't. Sheep are very communally, community-oriented. Now listen to this part. They defend one another. Even show symptoms of grief and sadness over loss when they see a fellow flock member headed to the slaughterhouse. Neurologically, understand their brain construction enables them to feel a wider range of emotions such as happiness, boredom, fear, and even anger. Now this I didn't realize, but they have superb spatial memory, able to remember what they have learned for at least six weeks. Who knew that? Sheep are able to grasp symbolic meaning. Understand this, researchers tried presenting several different colors of buckets at feeding time, always putting the food in the same colored bucket. And the sheep learned to bypass the colored buckets they knew had nothing in them, going straight for the ones that contained food. Pretty awesome, right? To me, that was awesome. Who knew this about sheep? I didn't, because all I was ever told is they're dumb. We, were, we used to sing this song in, in youth group when I was growing up. I just want to be a sheep. Bah. I don't know who wrote it, but I am really angry with them. Because I was in a youth group of about 500 teenagers. And can you imagine 500 teenagers singing, I just want to be a sheep. Bah. We raised a generation of dorks. 
No wonder we can't win the world. With songs like that, that's, that's anthemic right there, ladies and gentlemen. That's the anthem of my generation. Uh, Here's the kicker, though. From another article that I read, it stated that sheep have developed at some level what is called object permanence. Object permanence. This means that if you gave them food and then you cover up the food in front of a sheep, the sheep is still aware of the presence of food even though they can no longer see it. Now, y'all better understand that. That means that you don't have to just come on Sundays to know that God's presence is real and near you. Come on Sunday because, and don't, you better stay for the close because there's, that's, that's important. But I need you to understand that even when you don't see God, object says he's still there. Even when you can't see him in your circumstance, you have the confidence of knowing that it's still, that he is still present. And understand this, learn to recognize the real one. That's why, this is, this is what is so funny, is that Jesus, not a shepherd, he's a carpenter. He's the son of a carpenter. He didn't work in the field, all right? He's called the great shepherd. We love that, the great shepherd of the sheep. And Jesus himself is the one who looks at, at this crowd of people and says, my sheep know my voice. He's saying, and so understand what he said, my sheep know my voice. He said not just that they know it, but that they know it and continue to know it. It is, a, it is an object permanence in their life. It, it is a spatial reality. It is a recognition of faces. It is all of those things. Not only do they know my voice, but science has proven that what Jesus said was right about sheep. Sheep are not dumb. Which is why we are compared to sheep. Because we're not dumb either. Why Jesus says, my sheep know my voice, is is also implying not only do we know his voice, because, listen, I, I, I promise you, and I've told this so many different times, it's almost embarrassing, but Stacy can still whistle in the store away from me, and I'm attuned. And I will, I will, I will do everything I can to locate where she is at. With a whistle. Because I understand that's that, that she's, she's not calling for my help. She's probably calling to find where I'm at. Because normally if we're in the store together, she's handling the business and I'm walking around. <laughs> like a lost sheep. <laughs> you aren't kidding. <laughs> so she whistles and I go, hey, where's she at? Because there's this recognition that, hey, she's trying to communicate. Listen, if we would understand to quiet ourselves, and listen, Walmart's not exactly the quietest place on the planet. But I can tell her whistle apart from everyone else's. I can tell her whistle apart from everyone, uh, from all the noise that's around. I can tell. So why is it that I can do that, but I struggle with doing that with God? I would argue that I don't struggle doing that with God. I choose to tune him out. Which would simply mean that as a sheep, I'm becoming rebellious. Because I know I know his voice. I know what his voice sounds like. And so if I'm not listening to his voice, it's not because I don't hear it. It's because I choose to turn it off. So I understand when he's talking about this, this sheep here. Sheep may not be the smartest animal. But I find that emotionally, sheep have more in common with humans than the apes do. Which is why I think it's important for us to understand the sheep in this context and this understanding of of devotion that they have to their shepherd. So think about what David is saying. My shepherd. Not only is he saying he's the one who takes care of me, he's the one who protects me. He's declared not an ownership of him, but an ownership by him. 
and in be, being declaring an ownership by him, David is confessing to anyone who's willing to read that when he speaks, I hear him. When he's in the room, I know he's there. And when he's not in the room, I know he is there. That I can go in front and when he teaches me what I can and cannot have, what is good for me, what is bad for me, I am capable of retaining that understanding and knowing that as long as I am following in his instructions, I'm taken care of. This is simple, ladies and gentlemen. It's a simple life, right? And now we get to the best part. The Lord is. The Lord is. And I think this is important because David separates in this phrase, the Lord is. Because it's not just the Lord, it's, it's the Lord. The Lord meaning only one, the Lord is. Not a question, not a doubt, not a is. Is is a word that does not, that, that does not denote possibility. Is denotes fact. Is does not denote this, I, this, this concept of hoping and thinking and possibility and maybe a dream. It denotes that this, this experience is real. This is true. He is. He is. The Lord is. And this is the hard part, since in order to greatly appreciate lordship, you have to relinquish the one thing that makes you who you are. Control. We have to admit that at some point we are all, in fact, control freaks. There's like four people nodding their head in, in, in the sense. We are all control freaks. We are all control freaks. Most of the time, the only person we actually trust is ourselves. So that limits our pool of resources to accomplish and problem solve in our lives. Yet we have to deal with David's words here. David says the Lord is. What if we change the emphasis just a little bit? What if the inflection on the word the was more pronounced? Then we would be saying the only Lord is. And if we emphasize the word is, then we have a self-contained, all-consuming statement of full belief in his existence. Ladies and gentlemen, do you believe he is? If he exists and he is the only one and he is also Lord, then he is inescapable and ultimately in complete authority. The name Lord and the title Shepherd in the Mediterranean world both were used as concepts of kingship. A good king wasn't just in charge. He was a good provider. He was a good protector of his people. What better kingly name than Lord? Now the word Lord in the Hebrew is the word Yahweh. Now I'm going to be careful saying this because it's normally written Y-H-W-H. And it is the name that is most holy. It's the name you cannot say. It's so important. It's so holy that name. If you've ever seen someone who is from Israel or a Jewish individual write the word, write the name God, they will always capitalize the G, put an underscore and a D, because to spell his name is almost blasphemous. That's a good word, Jack. Blasphemous. It's in, it's it's deeply holy. Deeply revered. And so by me saying, understand, he's, he's gone beyond just the relationship of what's up, God. He is willing to mention the name that cannot be said. And so here he is, this name, when, when, you, when you study it out, it is also the word, uh, the name Jehovah. The name of the one true God with a focus on his sure existence, he is, and his relationship to his covenant persons and people. He is the God who keeps covenant. Yes, amen, amen. He is the God who keeps covenant. When David used this name, it was to separate which God he was talking about. See, they lived in a time of other gods being worshipped in various ways, even in Israel. So to separate and to elevate God to the highest place, he was referred to as Yahweh, the name so sacred that it became the name you didn't say. 
so holy to mention. In all biblical manuscripts that we have in, in, in our uh, uh, reach to study, when this name is written, there are cues written next to this name that tell the reader to not say this name, but rather to use different names. Those names are, are Adonai and Elohim. Adonai and Elohim. The name Adonai means sovereign or the one who reigns from above. The, the name Elohim means the almighty one. And, and so it's great to recognize he's almighty. It's great to recognize that he is sovereign. But David chooses not to use either one of those names. He chooses to use the most holy, most powerful name in all of the created universe. The name you can't say. Which tells me that David had a different kind of relationship with the name you can't say. It means that, that, that David dug a little deeper than just, what's up? I was walking by your house, thought I'd come by and visit. It's more than just a text message I was thinking about you today. Wondering where you've been. It was an intimate relationship that he had and has. Excuse me, God's not the God of the dead, he's the God of the living. In the New Testament, Paul says, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Same expression. Taking into consideration the three names used for Lord in Hebrew, and while I know that, it, that New Testament is written in Aramaic and Greek, we must also understand that Paul was a Jew first. So while his reference would have been to all three names, he chose the Greek word that would simplify everything for the reader and use a word which means absolute authority. So when Paul says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, he says confess with your mouth that Jesus, my deliverer, is the absolute authority. I know this message has all of a sudden gotten hard. We had such a good time of worship, and now we get to a place of hardship. This is not hard, ladies and gentlemen. It's abrasive. And the reason it's abrasive is because I'm trying to sand off the rough spots in your life. Because in this room are giant killers. And you don't kill giants with rough stones. You kill giants with smooth stones. And so if you are going to be smooth, you have to have dealt with some abrasion. And so I'm being abrasive with you this morning, not because I hate you, not because I want to punish you, but because I want to see you being prepared for when the Lord says, throw this stone. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. And the enemy begins to be defeated. Hallelujah. Okay. And so I want you to hear this, that, that he says he is absolute authority. If he's absolute authority, then under the umbrella of absolute authority is provision, is protection, is shepherding, is relationship, is voice, is face, is instruction, is leading, is guiding, is relationship. It's all of the above written under the name absolute authority. And listen, since he couldn't just say he was absolute authority on earth, he had to say it this way. Confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God did the unthinkable and defeated death, making him eternal. Oh, come on now. He can't, he's not just the absolute authority on the earth. He's the absolute authority in the universe. He's the absolute authority in the hereafter. He's the absolute authority over death, hell, and the grave. He's the absolute authority over every part of your life and everything that you could possibly imagine and consider that you might go through, that might come against you, that might be a celebration, that might be a great time in your life. Jesus is the absolute authority over all of those things. And ladies and gentlemen, if you can get this point... The simple life can be yours. The simple life can be yours. Huh. Man. Romans 10, 9. And I, I want you to understand this. It is it, because, And I'm not trying to ruin 600 years of, of altar calls for salvation. 
But ladies and gentlemen, Romans 10, 9 does not say ask Jesus to come into your heart. He said confess lordship. Romans 10, 9 says confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. Salvation is not, is, is not you asking Jesus to come into your heart. It's great that we deal with that with little, with little children because it makes it, it, it was to make it palatable. Because children don't like to be told what to do, do they? And so the only way that they could understand to ask Jesus into their, to, to, to declare Jesus as Lord was to say, Jesus, come into my heart, the one place that controls everything about me. But we've taken that and we've turned it into adult altar calls. And the problem with adults is that they should think like children, but they don't. And so we've got to get to, the, we've got to understand that when he says that, that you are declaring an absolute authority, you are now declaring a lordship. When we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that is the place of salvation. And believing in our heart that God raised him from the dead. That, that's, that's the belief that he's not just here on earth as a, as a figure in my life today. He's a figure in my life forever. And from that declaration you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made to salvation. We understand that this is what Romans was talking about. It's an absolute surrender to his position as absolute authority in your life. To place him somewhere other than absolute authority is dangerously close to idolatry of self-worship. Listen, the truth is, is the day that you think that you have more smarts than Jesus does. More wisdom than Jesus does. Can handle more than Jesus can. Can lead you through things that, better than Jesus can. You've set yourself up to be an idol in your own life. Now that, that is across the board in any area of our lives. Listen, I understand. We've got to, that, 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 that says a lot. That's a big mouthful. And I understand that they lived in the Mediterranean world and pretty much most of them wore long flowy garments. They didn't have uh, electricity. They, did, they, they didn't have all of the things that we have. The progress had not peaked and, and, you know, it took them months to get anywhere. I mean, you know, it's, it's just they, they didn't have information at the fingertips. They didn't have all of these things. And yet it didn't really matter because he was, Paul was writing this from the perspective of living in the most technologically savvy at the time communities around the world. The Romans invented the aqueducts. They were smart. Indoor plumbing came from the Romans. The concept, at least. So I uh, understand there's, he was living in amongst technologically savvy thinkers. He, he lived amongst the greatest thinkers of the world who could think anything up. They were, they were smart beyond compare. And he said, he said I, could, I could line my accolades up with them. And, and yeah, I'm smart. And yeah, I'm accomplished. And yeah, I'm all of this. But I consider it nothing compared to the glory of Jesus in my life. Because Jesus... Is Lord And see, the question isn't how to do this. I'm closing. The question isn't how to do this because that's a matter of examination and faith declaration. The, the question isn't how do you do this because, ladies, uh, let me tell you how to do this. You need to examine yourself because I promise you, you know I'm right. Examine yourself. Allow the Spirit of God to put you in check in the things that as you examine, you see that they're not where they need to be. And then begin to be, be bold in declaring faith in your life about who Jesus is and put him back to the right position where he belongs. So it's not a question of how to do this because, that, because of, uh, of that. The, the question is how do you maintain it? And that answer is equally as simple and must be equally supplied with determination in our part. I, I want to challenge you from this closing to be determined. Be determined. Because the answer to, to that is to abide in his presence. And we accomplish this in a lifestyle of worship and the word. We make this happen by coming into his presence, realizing you, that you can't be everywhere, but he can. It means coming to church, absolutely. It means laying aside the burdens to focus on Him and sing and worship with hands, arms wide open. It's, it's not just reading His Word, but meditating on it and engaging it. You may say that these are disciplines, and ladies and gentlemen, you would be correct. 
These are disciplines. So the only way they develop is by doing them. And the more you develop through doing, the stronger they become until the form is now a habit. And a habit develops into a lifestyle. But the, more, but the, but the most important key to this is to start. Now, here's the thing. We've got the worship. We love the worship. We love to sing. But it's time to dig deeper in your singing. Because some of us just love to sing because it's a good tune and it's easy to dance to, like American Bandstand. Only the older generation is going to know what American Bandstand is. <laughs> but I, but, but I, I challenge you with this. Dig deeper in your worship. Dig deeper in your worship. Get it, not just, not just singing the songs you like, but singing all the songs to the Lord. Not just trying to be a voice in the crowd, but to be the voice that you want God to pick your voice out above everybody else's. Which will only cause you to be determined to be more loud. That's all. That's, that, which is good. But on top of that, I want you to dig into the word. The life is in the word. The life is in the word. Engage the word. It's not just read it or listen to the 30-second devotions on the Christian radio station and go, oh, yeah, that's great word. If it doesn't cause you to open your Bible and dig into that verse, it wasn't that great a word. It's time to become people of the word of God who, who, you, who have it conversationally in their lives. It's not just, not just something you do for five minutes, 30 minutes, an hour every morning or every evening before you go to bed. It becomes your life, your breath. It, 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 it's the, the word of the Lord. It's like that, that song that we, we used to hear sung. It's like fire shut up in my bones. It's not, this, not just the prophetic word. It's the word in my life. If I surround myself with the word of God, drench myself myself in the word of God be cleansed by the word of God be shaped by the word of God be strengthened by the word of God be used in that sense the word of God through my life and bringing me to a place of absolute surrender where the first thing that comes to my mind in a situation is not that I go questioning what my options are it's that the Lord goes this is what my word says this is what my word says Faith is, faith is built on this is what my word says. Yes, God, you are my shepherd and I trust you. Lord, are you sure you want me to steer right when it looks like left would be a better way? Go right. Okay, I'm going right. You're with me, right? Yeah, I'm with you. I've always been with you. Don't ever doubt that again. I'm with you. Okay, we're going right. God, this is uncomfortable. Yeah, but I speak peace in the middle of all this. Don't worry. It's not you speaking peace. It's him speaking. I speak peace right now. I'll keep going. I'm speaking peace into your situation. And, and peace is coming. You see, you, you, and, and the funny thing is, is that when he begins to speak peace in your situation, it doesn't mean your situation changes. It means you change. Now, y'all didn't hear that. You, you think that speaking peace into a situation is your situation changes. No, speaking peace into a situation is you change. So when he speaks peace into the situation, he speaks peace into you so that all chaos could be going as you turn to the right and you're following the Lord. And yet you still walk as life begins to slow down and you begin to see everything. Eyes wide open. Church, this is just week one. But if we can get this. Understand, if we can get this and we begin to pull together the big picture of this 23rd Psalm, then we begin to understand that from the 23rd Psalm, every gripe, every complaint, everything else that David ever wrote always led him back to the response of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Oh, they hate me. They've come after me. My enemies are in my face. They're at my behind. I see the evil and they're constantly benefiting. And God, I'm just freaking out. I'm frustrated. I 
hate this life. I wish you had never called me to be king. I can't stand the people that I'm ruling over. In fact, well, except for a few, the ladies, they're kind of cool or whatever. And here, it is. But life is chaos. Life is terrible. The enemies don't like me. My friends don't even like me. No one likes me. But the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Oh God, the enemy came in while we were at war and they took my wife and kids. You ever thought for a second that David's encouragement, encouraging himself in the Lord was actually getting to a place of worship in the word and letting the Lord restore him? Because it took him back to the 23rd Psalm. That's the foundation and the heart from which everything else is written that he wrote. And this is what guided his life so that he was quick to say, I have a question we need to ask the Lord. Go get me the ephod. Let's ask the Lord. What's the Lord got to say? Are you sure you want me to go there? Okay, I'm going there because I trust your vision more than I trust my own. I'm going to go. David was a mighty man. But he was a man after God's own heart. And it wasn't just because he was a shepherd. It's because he was a sheep who loved his shepherd and had deep relationship with his Lord. So church, I'm, I, I, I close with that. And I ask you this morning, do you want the simple life? Do you want to have the simple life? You don't have to answer that out loud, but do you want to have the simple life? The simple life begins and ends in lordship. It begins and ends with, with Jesus seated on the throne, the ultimate, absolute, universal authority in your life. You as a sheep attuned to his voice, attuned to his face, following after him, seeking his provision, trusting his presence. It, it, it's you digging into the presence of God, Sunday through Saturday and starting it again on Sunday it's you digging into his word and treating the word as the vitality and substance that you need to make it through the week and to make it through life it's it's you getting to a place where Jesus has become the absolute answer to everything because he's the absolute answer to everything so stand with me